we think tonight's going to be a uh, interesting. Uh, I'm 68 years old and I have read parts of the book of judges. Uh, I've heard it preached, uh, also probably 40 or 50 times in my life. Uh, but tonight is the time where we've done a, uh, first verse to last verse overview of it. And I uh, hope y'all get, get a lot out of this. All right. Well, where are we? Let's see where we are. We are in the Holy Land. And if y'all recall what this map is, this map is a map of um, the uh, pre-conquest tribes. And y'all know from past uh, sessions who these people are. Here's what I want to uh, get your bearings on. This is the Mediterranean Sea. This is Egypt down in here. This is the Dead Sea right here. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan Rift Valley. You've heard me talk about that, the Jordan Rift Valley. Okay? And then up here is Mount Hermon. And we told y'all that Mount Hermon plays a major, major role in your Bible stories, especially in the New Testament. Okay, so here we are. Y'all remember Og and uh, Sihon, uh, the Moabites, the Edomites? Y'all remember all those? Okay, well, here's the land of Canaan with all those tribes that were there. Now, where are we going? Well, if y'all remember what this map is, this is the map showing where the tribes of Israel were supposed to take over. They were supposed to take over all these territories. Now, East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben uh, were allowed to stay on the east side of the Jordan River, even though they were required before Moses would give his blessing for them to stay over here. The fighting men had to cross over and help defeat the armies that would come against the Israelites in the land of Canaan proper. Okay. And then all the other tribes, the other half of Manasseh and the other, um, that would leave what nine tribes show here. Here's where they are shown. Okay. Now where are we going next? And what did we say last time? The problem that was exposed to us in the book of Joshua is the fact that even though militarily uh, the Hebrews defeated the armies of the land of Canaan, the problem was they did not go on and occupy the promised land. And here is the extent at the end of the military conquest, this is about the extent of the lands that were held by the Hebrews. And again, here's the Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan Rift Valley, Mediterranean Sea. So where are we? Uh, you should be caught up in understanding where we are now. When are we? Well, the book of Judges covers the period of time between the conquest and the first cries for a king. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the end of Joshua's military campaign. That's around 1400 B.C. The time of Samuel is about 1035 B.C. And remember, in B.C., uh, before Christ, we're counting down the years. So from 1400 to 1035, we're talking about a, a time span covered by the book of Judges of approximately 365 years. Okay. All right. Now, Mama's fixing to give you a overview, uh, very important, uh, of the book of Judges. First of all, I want to tell you that if you're able to see a screen uh, and you're not just listening to this, don't, don't do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all the clips that are taken from that I'm using on here, I stole 
uh, I took them from a YouTube channel called Bible Project. And if you've never seen that particular YouTube channel before, uh, I highly recommend it. And I'm I'm putting still shots on here, but this guy, of course, this may just be special to me because I'm an artist, but they draw this in real time, uh, you know, of course, sped up. And as they teach you each thing, they draw in the elements of this. And it's really a great way to learn. I, I'm one of those people that needs a visual. And so um, this is one of the first slides that they kind of came to. I think, you know, he starts out, so remember. Um, and here we see that Joshua, and of course you were just talking about this, led God's people into the promised land and reminded them to be faithful to their covenant with God and to obey the commands of the Torah. So here they are. We find them in the promised land. And I guess you would say they were in their uh, prescribed lands at that point in time. They, they were where they were to, to a certain extent. To the spots, yes. Yes, okay. So Judges is basically a tragic story of Israel's total failure. You know, now Joshua's died. Uh, they are left to their own devices, basically. So the name of the book Judges indicates the type of rulers that the people had before there were any kings, uh, but not like a courtroom judge or anything like that. This is more, think of it as um, regional, political, military leaders and tribal chieftains. And from time to time, these people that will spring up or God will raise up, we're, we're going to talk about some of them. Be warned. <laughs> uh, this, this is a tale of failure and of what not to do. You know, as disturbing and violent as this book may be, though, we, we also have to remember that it is a comforting picture of God's patience and faithfulness to his people. Uh, considering what he had to work with and how he saved his people over and over again, regardless of their unfaithfulness, reminds us of how God is faithful to keep his promises, even when the children of Israel were not. So the first section of this book, you'll see a one up here. I think y'all can see that. Begins with the tribes and their, as we said, prescribed areas of the promised land, not meaning that they had all gotten in their prescribed lands yeah. and occupied it. Yeah, not that they <laughs> occupied, occupied the full extent. Right. But they knew where they were supposed to be, and most of them got to the points of where they were supposed Ex to be. With, the, with a couple of exceptions. Okay, so Joshua had defeated the armies of many of the tribes. But there were still many Canaanite people still living in these areas. And we know that Israel was supposed to drive them out. And we also know that they didn't. We've talked about that before, not not completely. We we've talking about we we've talked before about some of the people in the land of Canaan, they were just supposed to obliterate. They weren't supposed to drive them out. They were supposed to kill every one of them. Men, uh, men women, and children and their livestock. That's that was the the judgment that God had on certain people. And then those he did not decree should be wiped out completely. They were to be displaced. And the, the Hebrews were to take over that promised land. But I, I guess, you know, and the reasons for this are given that, you know, living alongside these people would spread those pagan uh, rituals and tradition traditions, the, the moral corruption uh, especially remember the child sacrifice that they were so uh, infamous for. And throughout the book, we see how that corrupting influence permeates through the tribes who live alongside these pagans. Uh, you know, we, we can give a, a just a real life representation. And that is, you know, you think you associate with certain people that you're going to try to elevate them when in fact, what happens most cases, whether you're talking about kid, your kids, your relatives, whatever, what ends up happening is they are brought down. Uh, the others aren't elevated. Uh, you know, those who are, are the ones who are trying to do right and trying to be better, 
they're in fact brought down. Even with the best intentions. Even with the best this, intentions. This, this happens. It's human. Nature. Boy, this book of Judges is a proof. Yeah, proof. It's a proof text of that that right. principle. Go ahead. So what we see here is a you see this little circular uh diagram here because that's exactly what's happened. It's a cycle. We see the cycle begin. The Israelites would sin and then God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites. They would see the error of their ways. They would they would turn back to God. They would cry out to God uh, to save them in repentance. And then God would send a deliverer. He would raise up someone to deliver them from whatever they were under. They would enjoy a period of peace. And then eventually the cycle would begin all over again. Human so they just kept repeating this over and over again through the book of Judges. And I think this is such a good little illustration because even though he's in a period of peace, you can see his eyes looking upon and he's, going to the next. He's he's coveting his neighbor's. Yeah. How many times, well, how many times do, in the Bible does it talk about, you know, uh, the flesh and looking on at it and being around it yeah. so and living next to it, it's really quick to you know slip slip into that and but right here's i'm going to interject a, a, a principle y'all may have heard this before but uh a world war ii soldier came back uh, from the war and he grew up you know uh, in case y'all didn't know this america was mainly agricultural prior to, to world war ii and so, so many, so many uh, Americans left the farm, went into the military, fought the war, and came back. And most of them didn't go back to the farm. Most of them took jobs in factories. Most of them started businesses, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, they didn't have anything before, and they didn't have much after, but they did Mary had kids, had comfortable lives, relatively comfortable lives. And, uh, you know, dad drives a, a beat up Chevrolet pickup truck. Uh, well, you know, he, he comes along and his, uh, his son, one of his sons and his family come to see him and they're driving a Cadillac. He said, Hey, hey dad, how you like my Cadillac? Oh, that's nice, son. That's nice. He said, yeah, my, my son. I tell you what, he, I, I don't know what's gotten into him. He, he's, I saw him the other day. He was looking at Porsches and, and Ferraris and things like that. I, man, I tell you, and, and the granddad basically looked at him and said, son, your grandson is going to be walking. And that puzzled the son. He said, dad, what do you mean? He said, well, let me tell you, son, here's how it is. Tough times, I'm sorry, hard times make tough men. Tough men make easy times. Easy times do what, Mama? You had it right earlier. You told I me did. perfectly. Easy, easy times make soft men. Right. Soft men create hard times. And there the cycle is again. And there's there the cycle you again. It. You got it. It's human nature. And so that's what would happen. When, when it was tough on the Hebrews, they would repent, cry out to God. He would deliver. He would uh, give them a deliverer. And uh, God, and let's understand this. The stories in the book of Judges are not these people acting on their own. Many times God is so active in their lives. He's making it clear that when the story is going to be over, nobody's going to be able to give credit to the to the warrior it's going to be obvious that God was with them. God favored them. God made it happen. God actually provided the, the deliverance. But anyway, God would give them a deliverer, and they would have peace for a period of time. And then human nature takes over. We, the cycle starts again. Well, that's what this book is about. It continues to tell the stories of these deliverers that God raises up and, and the particulars of those situations. We're going to cover a few of them. We're going to cover the but I think six of the main ones. And I do want to say there are probably four categories here. We're going to go through the first three, you know, they do pretty good. Uh, you know, this, they, then we get okay. And then we get bad. And then we get, and then we hear the worst. So that's where we're going to go with this. Let's go to the first three. Help me say these names. Othniel. 
Othniel, Ehud, Ehud, and Deborah. And Deborah. So these were three people that God raised up uh, to defeat the enemies and deliver the people. Uh, and just like you just said, keep in mind that God raised these people up and through him, they are empowered to accomplish, accomplish these deliverances. It's not that they were all that great in, in and by themselves. God would raise up a person to come and, and save them. And he would make sure, just like you said, that that was that was obvious that it was God. It wasn't them. Mm -hmm. OK. Then the uh, next one, the fourth one we get to in chapter six through nine is Gideon. Uh, the Lord said to Gideon, with 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. We just need to remind you about the story of Gideon and how he came to be, have only 300 men. He started out with, I think it was 30,000. Yeah, well, the story is the Midianites were way, way out of their territory. They were. They were apparently a, a marauding band of, of soldiers at this point in time that had left the land of Midian, which is way down below Edom, way down below the the, uh, the Dead Sea. And this was a band, uh, this was an army uh, band, but it was huge, very large. And so Gideon, uh, the Lord raised Gideon up. Gideon cried out and said, hey, uh, from all the tribes, send me, uh, send me some men. So... Uh, he first gathered about 30,000 men, I believe it was, and God said, ah, That's too many. It's too many. Too many. So they whittled it down to 10,000. Whittled it down to 10,000. God said, that's still too many. If you go in there with 10,000 men and you defeat them, it'll look like by your own might and your own numbers and your own strength that, you know, y'all drove the Midianites out. So he tells them to go down to a brook or a stream, and he tells them to let the men get a drink of water. And after the men have drank, he tells him the ones that lapped water like a dog, send them home. The ones that cupped the water, you know, with their hand and drank with their eyes up, that will be the men that you take with you. Keith that, has a theory about that, man. That, <laughs> that was the 300 that were left. And, and God said, now you got the right number. Uh, be, from a man's perspective, I think you, you believe that. Uh, well, from a man's perspective, in order for you to get down on all fours and lap up the water like a dog, you had to set set your weapon aside. And your and, eyes were not looking. And your eyes were not danger. up. I mean, if y'all ever watch uh, National Geographic or uh, uh, Nova or any of those natural science shows, you, you remember the, uh, the meerkats? Remember how funny they are? But what do they do? The ones on patrol, they're standing up on their hind legs and they're constantly just, you know, eyes are just going everywhere. Well, it's the same principle. Uh, God wanted the, the men who stayed alert, stayed wary, uh, stayed on guard. Uh, you know, even though they were getting their water, the water was there. Uh, he That's who he wanted to, to make up his 300. Well, that's a good theory. Uh, that but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not a theory. Uh, <laughs> I think the scripture good... doesn't the scripture doesn't make it that clear. But <laughs> but anyway, uh, it perfectly makes sense. Let's let's keep on. He he. Uh, they have three hundred men, uh, and and that's it to go and do this with. Uh, th they are successful. Uh, they wipe them out. God gets the glory. Uh, they try to give Gideon the glory, and uh, they say, "Come and rule over us. You you've driven them out." And Gideon, Saved us. yeah, you're the You're driven out the intruders. Right. Uh, Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So, okay, great. Gideon's doing great. And he said, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder, because it was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear earrings. Uh, then he does something stupid. Gideon made the gold into an epoch. And uh, I don't know if y'all remember what an ephod is. I think we talked about this in the temple uh, priestly garments. You know, it's something that you wear on the, I think this little, uh, this little picture right here shows a little ephod. Yeah. Um, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Y'all remember, so, y'all remember from last time, where is the Ark of the Covenant right now? 
the Ark of the Covenant is at Shiloh. You remember that uh, during Joshua's lifetime, during a time of peace, uh, a period of, of no military activity, uh, Joshua relocated the, the tabernacle from Gilgal, which is right outside of Jericho, which had been the base of operations, up to Shiloh. And for the entirety of the book of Joshua, uh, I'm sorry, the book of Judges, Shiloh was supposed to be the spiritual center of the nation of Israel. Well, but obviously this, you know, <laughs> threw it up, threw it on its ear. Yeah. Uh, no sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted, them, prostituted themselves to the Baals. Uh, I, I think that may be why the artist uh, decided to depict this epod on a bull. a bull, you know, because that was the, that was his symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, they set up uh, Baal Barith as their god and did not remember. Now this this is the Israelites. They set him up as their god and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of their enemies on every side. <laughs> okay. Uh, before you go back to that page, let's sit here just 10 seconds. How much, since we've been doing this, how much have we lamented how quickly the Israelites, when, when Joseph uh, and Isaac uh, ended up in Egypt, how quickly the Israelites forgot Jehovah God? Then God starts performing all these miracles, all these signs and wonders. Oh, my gosh to get them out of Egypt, bring them along the Exodus, bring them through the, the, the wilderness, bring them up to the land of promise, all the miracles that, that God performed. And, you know, we thought that was bad, but look, there, these people are sitting in the land of promise and this is how they're treating God. Now we come to chapters uh, 10 through 12. Jephthah. 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 Okay, Jephthah was basically an outlaw. Uh, he was living away from society. His mother was a prostitute. He Now, he was an Israelite, but he was of illegitimate birth. Uh, he was more or less ostracized and disinherited, disinherited by his family. Uh he was a Jew and he was a Hebrew in name only. Yeah, and well, so many of them were. Yeah, so many of them were. But there were enough of the elders that you know. Let's let's read a real little bit of the scripture again. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, gods of the Ammonites, and gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. And guess what? Here we are. Remember that circle? Remember that circle? Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. Uh so the elders go, uh, Jephthah, Thoth, what is his name? Jephthah. Jephthah was, <laughs> y'all, we murdered these names. We don't even know if we're saying them right. We're uh, doing our best. We're doing the best we can. <laughs> he, he is, he's evidently strong. He's ev evidently known as kind of a, a, a bad guy, you know, a powerful person. So they go up and ask him for help. And he agrees to do it. Uh, at some point in time, he makes a vow uh, to the Lord to the Lord that if he will give the Ammonites into his hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. I don't know how smart that was, but well, this is such a Canaanite pagan practice yeah. that he would have been well familiar with these types of vows Actually, and things you'd give to gods in exchange for victories and, and all that stuff. Give, so giving vows. Th on, th on... They've, they've forgotten more than they ever knew. Yeah. Uh, so upon returning from victory, 
uh, his only child, his daughter, is the first one out of the door to greet him. Israel no longer even knows the character of their own God. You know, how, how do we know this? What is the one thing that is, has been strict throughout the story in the Old Testament up to this point? What is it? No child sacrifice. No, no human your, sacrifice. Period. Well, yeah, no human. But especially do not sacrifice your children do not to the do, fire. Let, suffer your children the fire of Moab and all that. Mole. Mole, yeah. Uh, so when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Um, the, the scripture says that he did eventually sacrifice her. And uh, to this day, she's remembered in certain ways by the Jewish people. <clears throat> Samson, you know, all I really got out of that story is he had a lot when I was younger is he had long hair and that was the source of his strength and Delilah was bad and as long as he was obedient he it, it, mm -hmm. it, it was all good when he was not obedient it was all bad yeah but uh, chapter 13 again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years um, so Samson you know, is born and grows up and he's, he's, they say that the, the spirit of God settles on him, you know, from an early age, but, uh, Samson is promiscuous. That's, that's a nice word. Uh, he's violent and he is extremely arrogant. Uh, he, he said to his father and his mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Paul's right there. Yeah. What do we know? God has repeatedly warned, do not marry uh, spouses from these foreign tribes. From these pagan tribes. and and It will you know, not end well. And we didn't put it here, but I mean, in the scripture, it says, they said, look, can you not find a woman of our own tribe that you could be happy being married to? Nope, that wasn't good. He wanted, he wanted her. But God allows it because he needs to raise someone up to get back at the Philistines and bring them out. Uh, so he, he worked, God works it into his plan. We see that happen over and over. Um, so the, the, the details in judges, you need to go back and read that story again, show how God used weaknesses and human choices to his own purpose. You know, the story of Samson illustrates God's empowerment of flawed individuals to accomplish his own plan. You know, Samson was given multiple choices to turn away, turn to God. And he did lead Israel for 20 years. Uh, but he was sexually immoral. He was violent. And as we said before, he was very arrogant. And you could read how he played Delilah, which was a Philistine woman. Uh, not the one he married. He didn't marry the first one. Then he had another prostitute and then he fell in love with Delilah. But Delilah uh, decides that she is going to, because they're going to pay her a ton of money. I mean, a ton of money. If she can find out what the source of his strength is, right? Mm -hmm. And so he plays with her and he tells her all these things. He's, it's almost like he's just amused by, by all this. But uh, he eventually, for some reason, he, does. He gets full of himself one time too many. Yep. And he tells her the truth. And uh, he winds up, uh, you know, they cut his hair. Uh, you know, I always thought, okay, it was in his hair. But I'm not 100% sure it was in his hair. Because the scripture says he awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. So maybe it was in that Nazarite. Nazarene vow, vow with the, with the hair, but you know not everyone was strong like that. Yeah, not but, all the Nazarites, even though they had long hair, they weren't strong like Samson. Maybe that was his way he was supposed to be faithful to to so, God. But anyway, so, so which which is the more powerful message that God had imbued him specifically, or he had long hair? Well, the long hair. You know, that's what you'll hear from Sunday school teachers and 
you know, TV preachers, but uh, I think it's more like Sonar said. It's uh, God said it's time to to take the my, spirit of God, to take yeah. my spirit away mm -hmm. from. Me. But his life ends basically in a violent suicide, and uh, which he did to accomplish the death of many Philistines. But you know, just this is another slide about what we were just talking about: the empowerment of God's spirit does not mean endorsement of human choices. It doesn't mean that God endorses it or he's fine with human choices. It means that he's working with what he's got. <laughs> Our mm. We make those choices. God has the power mm -hmm. to overcome our frailties, our limitations, our weaknesses. Well, he, he didn't just overcome them. He used them. That's, that's my point. He used them in his plan. That's my point. He let them make those choices. Ex excellent backup. Yep. Okay. Now, one more we want to talk about, and this, this is chapters 17 to 18. Uh, we have the story of Micah and the tribe of Dan. Remember, we were talking about everybody had their prescribed areas. Well, Dan didn't like their area, evidently, so they had not actually settled in it. But Micah, and the separate that out micah a little bit of a story there go back and read it he builds an idol and puts it in his house and he has a shrine uh where this idol and some household gods were kept he even installed one of his sons as his priest and he actually thought god would be good to him you know, he had a um, a young Levite come by that was traveling. And he talked him into staying and being a priest with him. And he thought God was going to really be good to him since he had a Levite, one of the Levites as his priest in his home. In this story, we see how far the children of Israel here, the tribe of Dan, has, Dan, <laughs> the, his tribe, Dan, the tribe of Dan has wandered, you know, from their God. Uh, they, they come in and they steal uh, Micah's idol, and they steal his Levite priest, who was lured away by the promise of power and riches, and they go to the city of, how you say, Laish? Laish. Laish. They attack them and burn down their city, and we see how far they've fallen. Uh, the grandson of Moses is their priest, and they continue to use the idol uh, Micah made all the, this is what the scripture says. They continued to use the idol Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. Isn't that so? That's crazy. Well, <laughs> let's take this opportunity now to speak about Dan. If you uh, go back to the slide of the of the territorial area that was given to Dan, if you go to that map. Uh, you'll see that Dan was to occupy, was to continue westward and go all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. And here's what you need to understand about uh, the situation the Hebrew tribes found themselves in. While Joshua was still alive, he and Caleb had defeated every Canaanite army that had come against them. Every one of them. The military might of the people that were there who occupied the, the promised land was no more. Now, they still had people there, but they were weakened. They had no fighting ability. They, had that, they couldn't stop the Hebrews from moving forward with what God had told them to do. But Dan, and, and Dan is in this particular section, is used as the example. Dan was afraid. Why were they afraid? It makes no sense for them to be afraid. It makes no sense for them to be afraid of a vanquished people. That's how badly the pagan gods had gotten into their heads. That's how bad the pagan people had, had uh, wielded influence over the Hebrew tribes. Was they made them afraid of, Afraid of what? Afraid of a paper tiger. That's what. Because the military might had been dis, uh, demolished. In any event, Dan would not move forward and go and occupy the fullness of his territory that would have stretched over into the over to the Mediterranean shore. 
And so instead, Dan basically uprooted his people and they just started wandering the highlands. And if you look on maps, you'll see a place called Dan, which is up above the Sea of Galilee. Well, guess what? That's where they they started. That's the city. I'm sorry. Right? That's where they ended up. They renamed it Dan. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and here's what you need to understand. That's not what where God had told them to go. And from this point forward, that area has been nothing but trouble. Now it was subdued by Saul. It was subdued by David and Solomon, but only for a period of time. And immediately after Saul fell into uh, Saul's uh, kingdom, fell into to chaos, the, the division of the tribes surfaced in, in, in a mighty way, which you'll see, uh, you know, in a few weeks when we cover that. Well, it can but, get that's, but that's just used, giving you the story of Dan as the example of they never should have been afraid. They should never should have not continued what they started. But that's where they found themselves. And at the end of the day, and I don't mean a 24-hour day. It, it took them a while to travel. But they ended up completely in a different territory from where God had, had actually put them. Well, it can get confusing when you're reading all this and trying to put all this together because there are so many times where God told them to go in and and wipe something out, burn it, mm -hmm. do it. And, and, and that was because God had his reasons for them to do that. Mm -hmm. But then there are other reasons like this one where Dan goes in. They're not even in the area they're supposed to be in. They didn't take that, which is an area they still have problems out of in Israel today. We're talking about Gaza. We're talking about that area. Mm -hmm. And so they instead go and take advantage of Micah and thinking that they have some God that's really going to help them, I guess, go and get the confidence to burn Laish and take it over and rename it Dan. Mm -hmm. so, so anytime you see the city of Dan that's up above the city of, uh, I'm sorry, the Sea of Galilee, now you know the history. Now, the last uh, chapters of Judges, we're not going to give any examples out of. Just know, if you want to go read these, these are very disturbing. And that is the point. That is the point. It's it's a shocking uh, recount of the corruption of the people of Israel, sexual abuse and violence. It leads to Israel's first civil war. They're, they're very disturbing. Uh, this book serves as a warning of what happens when the people turn from the God who loves them, the God who saved them from slavery, who brought them out of Egypt into the promised land. And one thing that we see like bookends in, in this, you know, several of these chapters in those days, Israel had no King and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We see this verse repeated uh, several times. We see how it sets up the next books in the Bible. God is at work. God is faithful to his promise, despite the evil of man. And I wanted to add in here again about the Bible project. They do, I think they have the whole Bible uh, on there. I'm not sure, but significant amount. Uh, maybe eight years ago or so, this is when this was done. Mm -hmm. no, they're not going to get into certain details, but to give you an overview, uh, this comment here says, I watch these before I read the full chapter to get a brief synopsis. That way I can understand the book better as I read along. And I think that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. very helpful um now there's nothing like the holy spirit revealing things to you and you know putting things together for you when you read that for yourself but these can be real helpful and just kind of get grounded in what's going on and these were some of the comments some of these were eight years ago four years ago that people wrote at the end of this particular video and just a couple of them to read those. The amount of times I mentally face palmed, that was me, myself, because of the cycle of the same sin that the Israelites kept repeating throughout the book of Moses, then in the book of Judges. Then I realized this is probably what I do in my day-to-day -day life. My father, God's love, mercy, and patience is undeserved. Praise God. And then one more I wanted to cover. If a non-believer, and this has happened to me before, and I know it's probably happened to you too, you know, would read this book and people who have read this book 
throw this out all the time. They will rant about how faulty it is and how awful our God is for letting these atrocious events happen. But as we can see throughout this video that we, the people, were responsible for all this evil happening and God was there to rescue us every time, even when we did exactly what he asked us not to do. So if you have time sometime, go and look at the Bible Project on YouTube. This particular one was called Book of Judges Summary, a complete animated overview. And it's so much better to watch that in live than just watching the still pictures that I put up here. Uh, Keith has some things. Here you go, honey. All right. I want to talk to you. Uh, I sent y'all uh, a little homework video. It was very short, only about six minutes long. I sent y'all a uh, homework video very informative and very timely as well it dealt with the mernefta stele uh which was the uh the stone stele that's housed in the egyptian museum at cairo was discovered by flinders petrie at modern day luxor in 1896 the stele dates from 1208 bc to 1203 what year exactly nobody's sure but for sure Based on all the evidence, it that stele was created somewhere in that five-year time period. So okay? I, I ask you, and you explained it real well to me, what is a stele? A stele is a stone that is uh, intended to be stood upright that has writing on it. And uh, examples of, of, of steles can be seen all over America. Just go look at any cemetery. Um, Every gravestone that's above ground, it can be considered a stele. Uh, so it's not necessarily, in this case, where people are buried like a tombstone, but it is a record of people dying. It's a, it's a record. It's a record. A record. Okay. It's a record that was intended to last for. Okay. For as long as they could, as long as the rock lasted. There you go. Okay. Now. The prior slide showed you the replica that was uh, constructed and stood up in the site where the stone was actually found. On the left side of this slide, you're looking at the actual original stele itself. It's uh, about four feet wide, and you can see by, by the scale there, uh, the person standing in front of it, it's about four feet wide. Uh, five feet wide and ten uh, over ten feet tall. And it's okay? in Egypt. It's in Egypt. Okay. The 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 original is in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo, Egypt. Now on this stele, the it mostly described Egyptian victories in parts of Africa, but a portion of what's written in that stele described victories in the land of Canaan. And Egyptian incursions into Canaan were not easily defended by the tribes of Israel. Why? Because they were so disjointed and not unified in any significant way. Oftentimes, they were too busy fighting among themselves that when the, when the Egyptians thought they needed to come through there, uh, they, 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 there was very little resistance of any significance. The, only, the, the biggest problem the Egyptians had was feeding their army and taking care of it uh, when it was su such a long distance away from uh, its its natural resources. Now, if y'all remember last time, we talked about the fact, and, and I showed y'all the map of where Israel actually, the Hebrews did actually occupy, and that Mediterranean coast was left completely untouched in, the, in these days. You showed us that it was like a highway. They could just go up that right through there to attack yeah and, and I, I i explained it because you know sometimes it's it's claimed by archaeologists well there's no record of and, and you know this shows you how crazy some of this stuff can get there's no record of the egyptians interacting with hebrews during this time period when they were warring with the hittites remember i told you the hittites were up north of canaan and the Egyptians are obviously southwest of Canaan. Well, they didn't have to interact with the Israelites. They could just stay along the coast, which is the straightest route anyway. Just went around them. They just went around them. Okay. 
But in this particular case, if y'all remember the the uh, Amarna letters that we discussed last time, where the city state kings who are basically puppet kings who are left in place because they pay tribute to the Egyptians. They're vassal states of the Egyptian uh, uh, government, uh, Pharaoh, okay? And if you remember us talking about the Amarna stones and there and these Canaanite city-state kings writing letters back to, to the Pharaoh saying, hey, come help us with these Habiru. The, the, these people are attacking us. They're, they're uh, taking over stuff. Um, you remember that. I don't, I don't want to repeat that. Uh, and so here's one uh, excursion of an Egyptian pharaoh who went into Canaan and basically, for whatever reason, he took out several things, as you're fixing to see. He dealt with, with several things. All right, why is my – I'm trying to get there. There we go. Okay. Here's what it says, and here's why the Merneptah – Stele is important. The part about Canaan says, plundered is Tehenu, Kati is at peace. Canaan is plundered with every evil. Ashkelon is conquered. Gizar is seized. Yanoam is made non existent. Israel is laid waste. His seed is no more. Kairu has become a widow because of Egypt. All lands together are at peace. Any who roamed have been subdued. Now, this is a stone monument created in 1200, uh, somewhere around 1208 to 1203 BC. What time period is this? This is right smack dab in the middle of the judges period. This is the time when, remember, there was no king in the land of Israel. Well, you notice each one had a little go back one. Each one has a little crown symbol above each yes. name. And that's that's what we're showing on the next. All righty. All right. Ashkelon, Gizer, and Yanoam are each denoted by the writing symbols to be city-states, which would be led by named rulers. And if you remember us talking about the Amarna uh, tablets last time, these rulers are the ones who were writing these, these uh, brick baked letters to the Pharaoh saying, Hey, come help us. We got these, we got these Habiru people that came out of the desert areas and they're just kicking our butts. Well, here's what their symbol looks like. This is the symbol in Egyptian hieroglyphics that indicates a city state, the city state. It wouldn't be a city state if it didn't have a vassal ruler who was, who willingly subjected himself to uh, the Egyptian pharaohs, and they had to pay tribute. They had to pay taxes to the pharaoh in order to stay in. Well, that was the reason they were left in power, is because they promised to collect taxes from the, their city-state people and pay a certain portion of it over to uh, Egypt. But Egypt, in return, was to give them protection, uh, put down disputes, help them with trade, commerce, things like that. All right. So here's their symbol. Israel, however, is shown by the symbols of a man and woman and many offspring, indicating that, quote, Israel at the time was a people group, not a kingdom. Now, folks, this is major. This is, this is so significant in the history of the Bible. Okay? Now, where are we talking about? There's Gezer. There's Ashkelon. There's Jerusalem. Where's that other that, where's that other city at? Where's that city called Yano Am? Um? All right. It's not on this map. One of the reasons it's not on this map is because there are four candidates that most people try to put. They don't know. They don't know. There's four candidates that different different groups of archaeologists are trying to they don't agree. They, they don't, don't agree. agree. So they don't okay. Agree. It's not on the map. Most of them are off of this map. They're up here in the northern area. Okay? Makes sense. But here's where Gezer is, and here's where Ashkelon is. Here's Jerusalem, and I want to point these things out to you. There's Bethlehem, Jericho, 
And remember what I told you about Jerusalem. You go to the north end of the Dead Sea and turn left, and you'll get to Jerusalem. Now, what other places are important? Shiloh, that's where the tabernacle is now. Shechem, that's where the uh, uh, the ceremony of the blessings and curses was had uh, back in, in uh, early days of, of the conquest. Okay? So here's what you're seeing right now. Remember what the scholar Michael Astour, a non-believer, said about the Hibiru people named in the Amarna letters? They were semi-nomads in the process of sedentarization. Big word. Who came from the semi-desert zone and entered civilized regions as strangers. They were members of tightly knit tribal units whose allegiance was determined by kinship and who had their own system of law. What else did he say? They acted in large armed units, which were not only engaged in plundering raids, but were also seizing for themselves towns and parts of the lands under Egyptian rule. History shows that whenever one finds independent armed bands, these were always ethnically homogenous. And we said last time, who is this described? It describes the Hebrews. There are no other historical candidates. So when it says Israel is laid waste, his seed is no more, and he uses a symbol of a people group, not a kingdom, it all fits. It all fits like a glove. What else does it fit? It fits the scripture. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Judges 18, 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that, blah, blah, blah. Judges 19, 1. There was no one unifying force over all of the tribes during the period of the judges. So, when the Merneptha Steely was found in, eight, in the 1800s, and people knew that it dated back to uh, 1208 to 1205, that is smack dab in the middle of the judges' period. What is described in the judges' period? Israel barely being identifiable. But what of the tribes could be identified, everybody knew they were the Hibiru. They knew they were all related. They knew they had come from the desert region. Ethnically homogenous. Ethnically homogenous, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're about to wrap up. Here's how we're going to end this evening. Is there significance in the phrase... Israel is laid waste. His seed is no more. Think about this. Put on your thinking caps, people. We know there's a well-documented pattern of ancient Egyptian rulers heavily embellishing their military exploits. But it's our opinion, and I'm talking about me and Snar, it's our opinion that a definite reference to the Genesis 3.15 seed war declared by Yahweh on Satan, and here's why. Ancient custom was that any time a king was subdued or either captured and was either captured or killed, his male heirs and relatives, male relatives, were executed right on the spot as quick as they could be rounded up so as to not be potential revenge adversaries in the future. If female captives were allowed to live, talking about of the king, the king's wives, daughters, servants, etc., they would become slaves in the houses of the prevailing military leaders. This was the practice back then. If you defeated a king, which is who would be heading up a city state, a king over the city state, okay, you didn't let any of his his uh uh, sons or his brothers or his uncles or nephews live. You kill them on the spot. That's the practice. It's well documented. Okay. For 365 years, Israel had no one single unifying military or political head whose seed would have been treated in the normal ancient custom after defeat. 
Yeah. Who would Manefta have targeted during this time for the killing of all such leaders, male heirs, and near kinsmen? Who was he going to? Who would he point and say, "I got to go kill uh, Jim Bob. I got to go kill. I got to go kill." There was, uh, there was no king. There was no king. There was no leader. And so the 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 bands that he would run into and defeat uh, militarily that could be tied to uh, uh, or identified as Hebrew, they would be smaller bands. They would be disjointed. They wouldn't be unified. Okay. And if you kill that leader, what sense would it make for you to claim that you have uh, destroyed the seed of Israel? Yeah. What seed? What, what seed? What seed? So what, so it, it's our opinion. It's, it makes absolutely no sense. To kill the family of a single leader of a defeated band of Hebrew soldiers from one tribe or part of a tribe would not reasonably be viewed as ending the bloodline of the leader of the of a leader of the nation of Israel. If there was significance in the mentioning of the killing of all the seed of a vanquished king, it would be reasonable to expect that such an expression would be made after the listing of the defeats of the kings of Ashkelon, Gezer, and Yanoam not after naming a nobody group of misfits who loosely claimed lineage from a long dead man named Israel. Mm -hmm. Let me show you what I'm talking about real quick. Look, look here. Ashkelon is conquered. The king's seed is no more. Gizar is seized. The king's seed is no more. Yanoam is made non-existent. The king's seed is no more. That would have made more sense. But it wasn't spoken of these three. It was only spoken about Israel. Well, we know it's not true. Israel exists today. Is 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 there today. Hebrews lived. There was no Egyptian king that ever wiped out the Israelites. We've seen this so many times, though. These Egyptian leaders love to embellish their accomplishments. Yeah. They were never going to go down as having lost a battle or not conquered something. They of course. But my point is, if if it would have been more reasonable to have used that phrase after the first three. Sure. I got you. Mm -hmm. And not the fourth one and leave the first yeah. three unaddressed. Yeah, of course. But just, just to put it out there, that just because they put it in a stele and wrote it in stone doesn't mean it was true. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we, we, we already knew that. All right. Okay. Just to remind you, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall, Her seed shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. The seed war declared by Yahweh on the serpent. Genesis 3.15. We are admittedly speculating. Sonar and I are telling you, we, 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 we don't can't put our this. finger on, on <laughs> something hard. But it's our belief that the little G God or gods behind the throne of Egypt at the time wanted this claim made. We know from history this claim later proved to be wholly devoid of truth. We know that Satan took Yahweh's declaration of the seed war seriously and his efforts to make sure the Messiah could not come to save mankind were unceasing all through the history of the nation of Israel. We do not believe that it was a coincidence that this spiritual swipe towards the Messiah was made the way it was for the reasons that I just told you. It didn't make sense to make that statement on right, the, written in stone, the people right group that he uh labeled as Israel, and he left the other three completely unaddressed, just mm -hmm. does not make sense. It's not a coincidence, it was purposeful and directed uh, at the Messiah, and directed at the Messiah. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Yep, all right, that's it.